All right, this morning we are picking back up in the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at these ones that are reapers. They're doing some reaping at this point, and this is in Revelation chapter 14, where we're going to pick back up here. So prior to this, we were looking at the uh, declaration of the fall of Babylon. So they're declaring, that is a messenger, is declaring the fall of Babylon. Now that fall of Babylon would take us to approximately mid-tribulation, because that is when the man of lawlessness is actually going to turn on the harlot, who is a religious system at that point, and Babylon is a reference to her, and destroy her because he's going to set himself up as though he is the only, well, he's going to set himself up as a God. More specifically, he wants to be the God. And then we have a warning to those who worship the beast. Now, of course, those who worship the beast, now, technically, it takes us all the way to the end of the tribulation period in that particular uh, statement, because it's saying what's going to happen to these people who worship the beast. Now, remember, those who worship the beast, it is a very specific group of people. They are ones described in Scripture as being earth dwellers, which would be the majority of the people on earth during the tribulation period. They are going to mark themselves with the name or the number of the beast, which, of course, the, the number is specifically described as 666. The name we don't actually have because the man of lawlessness hasn't been revealed yet. But they are going to mark themselves they, that is where primarily all of commerce and other stuff like that is going to be involved with. So if you don't have the mark, you can't buy and sell, not in the open market, so to speak. You know, um, kind of similar today, you don't have a credit card. It's, it's more difficult to be involved in commerce. Now, it's not, that's not a one for one. I'm just saying, you know, they're going to have the system that's set up where you've got this mark. And you get all the benefits of the, of the system. You don't have the mark and you don't. And they're also going to persecute those who actually reject the mark and who will not follow the beast. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, image that they're going to create is going to cause these who refuse to worship the beast to be put to death. You know, this is all that's going on. But we actually have a warning of what's going to happen to those who are going to, that are worshiping the beast because they are going to be destroyed in the end, and they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire along with the beast and his false prophet. Now we pick back up with uh, the happy, and it says, happy are the ones who die by a Lord. Now this is over in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13 through uh, 11. So it's going to talk about here the patience of the saints, and we see this in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 is where it begins. Here is the patience of the saints, the one keeping, the ones keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So you're going to see two aspects here. Um, they are the ones who are holding out under circumstances. Now, this word is actually a word for patience. It is not perseverance. Perseverance has a different implication to it. Patience is a holding out under circumstances. Now, they're holding out under the circumstances that they're in because they know the promises from God, and God is going to deal with this. They are the ones who will have to deal with those who have the mark of the beast. So this is, um, this is different than the group, by the way, that was killed at the be in the beginning of the tribulation period by the harlot. They are the ones we see up underneath the altar who are crying out to the Lord, how long? And he's telling them, wait, we're not quite finished yet. These ones know the promises of God. There's a different focus on, on them. And they are going, and these, these ones are going to be killed by the beast or by the followers of the beast. So they're going to be dealing with that. And scripture does talk about this. Revelation 13, 10 talks about the fact that those there will be those who go into captivity. If anyone who has captivity, he goes. If anyone kills by the sword, it is necessary for him to be killed by the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, this is talking about saints because we are going to have slavery come back into being very predominant during the tribulation period. And there are going to be those who are going to try to fight against this, but they're going to be killed because this is a time where the saints are actually going to be put back into slavery 
in the, um, and specifically, the, remember, primarily we're focusing on the Jews, but it also does deal some with the Gentiles who have followed the kingdom of the heavens, which is they believe the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens. That is not the same gospel we believe today, and they're not part of the church. Scripture is very clear about that, but they still actually are saved. They are still referred to as saints because there are saints of different dispensations. Their patience is they know judgment is coming upon these people. So in this case, unlike the ones who were prior, that is the ones who were killed by the uh, harlot, you know, which you wouldn't expect your religious system to start putting people to death for speaking the truth, but that's exactly what they're going to do. These ones, um, completely different attitude, where these particular ones, they're going to know judgment is coming, and they're going to be patient in that. And that's what they are to be doing, is being patient. These are the ones who keep the commandments of God. Now, the commandments of God here would go back to the Ten Commandments in relation to what God has commanded them. And then we also have, and the faith in Jesus. So we have Jews, again, Remember, primarily we're focusing around the Jewish nation again at this point. We have those who they're following the commandments of God and faith in Jesus, which means they actually believe in the resurrected Lord. They're going to have that faith. Remember the message at this time during the tribulation period is the message of the kingdom of the heavens. We had that message before. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of the heavens. He wasn't preaching salvation by believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. When Jesus was here on earth, that wasn't revealed until really right before his death, where he revealed a lot of stuff to the disciples, but they didn't understand it until afterwards. So he wasn't, pre he wasn't presenting that. They will be proclaiming the resurrection of the Messiah. As again, we're more Jewish centered in what's going on. The kingdom of the heavens relates to Israel and the coming of the Messiah for Israel and Israel taking the land that was promised by God in possession. But we also have a resurrected Messiah and they're going to know about that. Then we get into verse 13 where we have the happiness of the dead. Revelation chapter 14 verse 13 says, I heard a voice out from the heavens saying, Right, happy are the dead, the ones dying by a Lord from now. Yes, says the Spirit, in order that they should rest out from their toil, for their works follow with them. Now, there's a lot of things going on here. And uh, one of the things is, of course, these are the ones who are about to die. They, you know, and, and this puts us right at the mid-tribulation point, where these people are going to face death. And that death is going to bring them happiness. You know, and why would death bring you happiness? Look at what's going on at this time. Now, we already have the earth in chaos at mid-tribulation. Just before mid-trib, we're going to have a very massive war where Russia and her allies are going to be completely wiped out. And this is massive. We have famine. We have Wars going on. We have people who are starving. We have uh, some of the trumpets that have already happened. So you've got most of your water is poisoned. And there's just, there's a lot of problems going on. And these people are going to be taken into slavery. And when they die, it's going to be a relief for them because they're not going to have to suffer anymore. They're not going to have to suffer in their toil. Their work is actually done. They will be killed by their masters, or a master, or because it does actually use the word Lord. But remember, our word Lord in the Greek is actually a word that context is really important to pay attention to, because it can specifically refer to a person that is in a position of being a master. Or it can, in context, specifically refer to Christ, who is our master. As a matter of fact, when it's using Lord, that's what it's focusing on, is somebody who is your master. That's where it's a difference when you're talking about Jesus Christ the Lord. Each of those titles has a specific meaning to them. And it's the same thing here. I know some of our translations say in the Lord, 
but when you go back to the original, there's no article there, and it's pretty clear that the instrument by which uh, these people are being put to death is a lord. It's kind of interesting, actually, when you go back and you look at, through the book of Revelation, it never really focuses on, um, like in the sphere of death, it's always talking about the agent or the instrument by which death comes. Almost always in the book of Revelation, it's very unique in that sense. And here it's, it's the same thing. This is during the second half of the tribulation period. This is going to be happening, of course because uh, we are at this point after the harlot has been destroyed the man of lawlessness is setting himself up as though he is a god in the temple in jerusalem we have the um, image of the beast who is demanding that everybody worship the beast and that's what's going on at this point now this is not to say that there will be no religion at this point but predominantly the religious system will be destroyed so it'll be focusing on really the man of losses would be satan trying to set himself up as the god the god above all gods so to speak now we come to the reapers in revelation chapter 14 verses 14 through 20. now here we have the reaping of the gentiles is where we're going to start out with so revelation chapter 14 and verse 14 says and I discerned, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one seated, likened to a son of man, having upon his head a golden victor's wreath, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So the messenger, the, the, this messenger, is likened to the son of man. Now, speaking of, we we're actually just talking a little bit earlier about the fact that um, a lot of our words, there are some words that are transliterated, not actually translated in scripture. And when you translate them, it's, it gives you a better understanding of what is actually meant. We were talking about apostasy at this point, but here we're talking about the word angel. Some of our translations say an angel that lays likened to the son of man, but the word angel actually means messenger. So the question is, is it referring to a spirit being or is it referring to a person or human? Now here, I think it's pretty clear because it says likened to a son of man. Well, that is a very specific title used for Christ. So it would be better to say the messenger is likened to the son of man. This is the resurrected Christ that we're actually referring to here. And we can tell it's the resurrected Christ because he has a golden victor's wreath upon his head. And that's very specific to Christ. I didn't actually put this uh, section in here, but it is kind of interesting. If you go back and you look at the, at the wreaths that were given to the demons that come out of the abyss, it doesn't actually say they were golden. It says they were like gold. That's kind of important to actually pay attention to because like is not actually the real thing, which is kind of interesting. So basically Satan is giving his demons false gold as their crowns you know it's plated where this is actually real gold it says it was golden it is a golden victor's wreath and it's upon his head of course it's a, uh, a golden victor's wreath because he is a conqueror he is the one that was victorious in his resurrection he was victorious so he's going to have this he's going to be crowned with a victor's wreath because, of course, he is actually one who is victorious. And we see this over in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it talks about this. Because the wreath, the victor's wreath, is for his work on the cross and what he did there. And he overcame a lot of things on the cross for us. But specifically, he overcame Satan and death, and he was ultimately resurrected. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5, three days later, he was resurrected. Let me be specific on that. It's not like he was waiting. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5 says, for he, did not so, um, for he did not subject to angels the world to come. Now, in the context, I think angel is actually a good word there because it's referring to spirit beings and the world that's coming, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? 
you have made him a little lower or for a little while lower than the angels. Now, again, this is a reference to the son of man and it's him. It's not talking about all humans. It's very specific. He was made a little bit lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands and have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not see all things subject to him, but the reality is they will all be brought under his feet because he is the one who is victorious. He's the one who, as a matter of fact, when it says crowned him with glory, it actually uses a word that means to give a victor's wreath. It's different than placing a crown, which has to do with a kingly crown. That's, it's a different word. So it's a little bit hard to pick up in our translations because they just say crowned him with glory and honor. But it's actually, they, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, they, he gave him a victor's wreath of glory and honor because of what he did, because he was actually victorious. Because of the suffering of death, Hebrews chapter two and verse nine. But we do see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Crowned would be given a victor's wreath is what he was actually given. He overcame death. Now, the only way you can overcome death is to be resurrected. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had power over death. That is the devil. He was victorious, not only over death, but also over the devil. Satan goes back to that promise that was given to Adam and Eve, where God said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And that's exactly what happened. He was victorious in that. Then we come to another messenger called out to, then this messenger is going to call out to the first messenger to reap the earth. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 15. And another messenger came out from the Holy of Holies while crying in a loud voice to the one sitting upon the cloud. Send your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now the time has come when the son will request to the father to give him the nations. That's what it's talking about here. Now remember Christ is still, and there would be Jesus Christ, does have a human nature. It's a resurrected human nature. In his human nature, he does not know all things. In his divine nature, he absolutely does know all things. And in working through his human nature, we have, and it's referring to one likened to the Son of Man, where an angel is coming out and telling him, now is the time. And that's where we get this. It's uh, the reaping. And what is going to happen? The son in his deity is going to turn to the father and say, give me the nations. We see this over in Psalms chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them with er like earthenware. And this is actually what it's referring to here. So this is... At this point, when we really understand what's going on, we have now jumped to the end of the tribulation period where we have the second coming of Christ. And this is where this reaping is going to happen. Now, the reaping is for the harvest of dry grain. This is actually important to pay attention to again, because um, the way scripture describes this, it does actually show us that is the Gentiles. The angel is speaking to the son in his humanity, of course, would be a reference to that. And he is uh, telling him, now is the time to reap the earth. 
Revelation chapter 14, verse 16. And the one sitting upon the cloud cast his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. And now, of course, that's like very uh, summarizing what's going on, but he's going to return and he's going to crush the nations. He's going to not destroy them because some nations, that is Gentile nations, will be around during the tribulation period, or excuse me, the millennial kingdom period after the tribulation period, but he's going to crush them. He's going to destroy them and take his possessions. Now, this reaping is specific to unsaved people, is what it's referring to here. And this is, and we're going to see in the context why it's unsaved people. It's taking us to, like I said, right now we're jumping into the time period where we have the Battle of Armageddon. So this part in verse in, in Revelation 14, we do a lot of jumping around in a couple of different sections. So you got to pay attention because it's more summarizing a couple of events that are going on. And then here, as we move on in the book of Revelation, it's going to be more specific and give us more details. But right now, we're getting kind of a quick summary where the reaper is going to come, and it's the battle of Armageddon. And then we have the reaping of the Jews. So we actually have the reaping of the Gentiles and the reaping of the Jews at this time. Revelation chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. Now another angel comes out of the Holy of Holies with a sharp sickle. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 17 talks about this. So we're now we have the sun at this point. He is reaping the earth. And at the same time, we now have another messenger coming out of the Holy of Holies. Or you could say, reference it as an angel, because obviously it's very clearly referring to a uh, spirit being. He's coming out with a sharp sickle. Um, this is not Christ. Okay? This is the one who is, uh, Christ is reaping the Gentiles at this point. And that's what he has been, uh, you know, the, the, that's what's actually going on at this point is Christ is actually reaping the Gentiles. We have another messenger coming out. This angel then with the authority over fire calls to the angel to reap the vines, that is the Jews. It's a little bit different. And he's not calling to Christ. He's calling to another angel. Now, it does talk about an angel with the authority over fire. This is Revelation 14, 18. And another angel comes out from the altar, the one having authority over the fire. By the way, it is very specific. It doesn't say fire in general. It says the fire. Well, what fire would he be referring to? He's coming out from the altar and called out with a loud voice to the one having the sharp sickle saying, now another angel came out of the Holy of Holies with a sharp sickle. And now we have this angel who has authority over fire, more specifically the fire of the altar. He's coming out and speaking to that second angel that has the sharp sickle. It's not talking about the Son of God. That is not talking about Christ here. Send your sharp sickle and harvest the clusters of the grapes of the vines of the earth because their, gri their grapes have come to maturity. The angel having authority over fire, when we look at that, um, like I said, the fire is referring to the fire of the altar in the context. And that is actually really important because there are other passages that talk about the fact that there are angels who have authority over fire or an angel that has authority over fire, not the same angel is referring to. As a matter of fact, we see over in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 that it is Michael who actually stands up for Israel. Now, what's going on at this point? What is this reaping that's happening? This reaping is the reaping of the unsaved Jews, of the rebellious Jews. And we'll see that in the context here. So we actually do have Michael, who is going to stand up in the last days. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. The ones who are not written in the book are going to be destroyed. Now, Michael standing up for Israel is also going to mean those who are um, rebellious, those who 
refuse to accept God or follow God are going to be destroyed because it wouldn't be a good thing for them to continue on with Israel, would it? They're not going to continue into the millennial kingdom because they don't actually believe the Messiah. They're not, um, they're really not what you refer to as Jews. Because remember, a Jew is not a Jew because they're born a Jew. Jew, it has to do with believing the promises of God. Vineyard always refers to Israel, by the way. Where before we had the dry grain, the term specifically used of the harvesting was a harvesting of dry grain. Where here we have a vineyard being referenced. Vineyard over in Isaiah chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 1, and then we'll jump to 7, where you can see that this is a reference to Israel. So Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. And you jump down to verse, um, well, actually, let me finish this one. My, my well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. Jump down to verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So it's specifically telling us that when he's referring to a vineyard, he's talking about the nation of Israel. And he's the one who's ultimately uh, in the context here. Well, actually, I can finish reading this. It says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant uh, plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. But he's going to come in and he's going to destroy that. So the unsaved Jews, the rebellious Jews at this point, they're the ones who are going to be reaped. They are cast into the wine press of the burning anger of God. Now, this is why we know it's actually the ones who aren't saved, because those who are saved are saved from the wrath of God. Wouldn't make any sense to save somebody and then express wrath to them these particular ones are then cast into the wine press of the burning anger of god so some tr translated as wrath but here it is actually a thumos is the term here so it's a little different and the angel cast his sickle upon the earth and harvested the grapes of the of the earth and cast into the wine press of the great burning anger of the god wine press of course is talking about judgment at this point you know here we have christ is stomping the wine press that the angel casts the rebellious jews into now again going back into the context now it does actually kind of switch in its concept here because at first we have the the reaping of the dry grain but then it's described as a wine press why is it described as a wine press because of how they're going to be destroyed. Christ is going to come back and it's going to literally be like a wine press. Because it talks about the fact that there's going to be blood splattered up on his garments. And they're going to be splattered up on his garments because he's going in to stomp them. And he's going to destroy the Gentiles. Now, while he's destroying the Gentiles, the unbelieving Jews that... Where are the unbelieving Jews at this point? Or where predominantly are the Jews? They're predominantly in the wilderness. And an angel is going to go there, and he's going to cast any of those unbelieving Jews into the wine press of God's wrath. They're not going into the millennial kingdom. They're going to be destroyed. <clears throat> so here in the context, it's not talking about the entire nation of Israel. It's talking about unbelievers just like the reaping of the earth is not specifically talking about all humans on the earth at that point it's talking about those unbelievers the nations he's going to come and he's going to destroy the nations he's going to come and take it for his own we have the trampling of the rind press then specifically referred to in revelation chapter 14 verse 20 and he trampled the right the wine press outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press until the bridle of the horse from one thousand six hundred stadium would be the reference here. So now he, the one doing the trampling, that is, by the way, that's Christ. And yes, we as saints do come back with Christ, but we are not going to be involved in this war. 
We are going to stand there and watch the one who is victorious over death, victorious over Satan, the one who actually saved us. He's going to destroy those who oppose him. He's going to utterly wipe them out. Now, it's going to start, this trotting of the wine press is going to start outside the city of Jerusalem, and it goes for approximately 180 miles. That's what the stadium reference there would be. When it talks about here, um, back over here, it says uh, 1,600 stadium or stadii uh, is, a, is a way of measuring. Of course, they're using a stadium as an indication there. which is going to give us approximately anywhere from 176 to around 180 miles where we're going to have uh, blood at point is going to be up to really the uh, bridle of the horse. Now, it's not specifically saying for that entire time. It's going to say that there's, you know, it's the way that it's describing it as he's crushing them they're actually going to be um, in the wine press. They're actually going to be blood up to the bridle of a horse because he's crushing them. He's destroying them in that way as he's actually returning here. That's a long time or a long distance, but of course that is specifically return, referring to uh, the Battle of Armageddon where the Battle of Armageddon stop, starts because the nations are going to actually be brought up against him. And there, remember, we have at this point, and really as we go on in the book of Revelation, again, we'll see more detail about this, but we have the, the East and the West armies coming together. They're fighting, but then they turn because they see the return of Christ at this point, and they turn and they go to battle him, and he completely and utterly destroys them at this point. Now, this would be the, the, the armies are going to be destroyed, and he's going to take the nations for his own. He's going to completely crush the nations. The world system that we know today is going to be gone. It's, he's going to completely crush it. So in this context here, we have happy are the dead who die by a Lord. Now, remember, you know, in reference, um, and it is important to pay attention in, in Scripture, how it's actually using the word Lord. It's not talking about um, those who are in the Lord like we in the church are in the Lord. Because as a matter of fact, it never actually refers to the church as being in the Lord. When you hear in the Lord, or we, we have a reference in relation to the position of the church, where does it actually refer? That reference is in Christ, in the resurrected, glorified one. There's times where it uses in Christ Jesus which would, would relate to his humanity, but it never says in the Lord because that's not actually the focus. So understanding the way that the original language actually uses these things is really important because we can see here it's not actually saying that these are Christians because they're not in the Lord. And it is talking about the instrument by which they die. And this at this point, in mid-tribulation, this is going to bring relief for these people, which is why they're going to be happy. Their toil is going to be done. Now, you can see that they're working because they have patience. You can see that their toil and their work that is actually being done at this point is because of the patience in relation to the promise that they know God is going to judge these ones who are doing the wrong at this point. So a little different than the ones who were killed by the harlot. Because they really, as you can see in, their, in the way that they respond, the ones in, under the altar, they really didn't seem to expect to be killed like they were. It's like they were the ones trying to do things that were right. It's kind of funny how humans who want to do things wrong react to truth. You would expect people to react to truth in a positive way. This is the way things really are, but oftentimes they do not. Matter of fact, they can act very violently towards it, and that's what's going to happen. But these ones that are going to die, they're going to die by the Lord. 
And no, they're even in, in a very harsh environment that they're in because we do have, we're in mid-tribulation. During this time, of course, we're going to be going as we move on in the book of Revelation, we're going to be going into uh, the bowls of judgment and um, a couple of other judgments that are coming upon our, the earth at this point. Things are going to get really bad at this time. As a matter of fact, scripture describes this as the great tribulation period. So we go from the from the tribulation period to the great tribulation period. It's going to be a tough time. So no, they're not going to go out and end their own lives because they have a promise from God. So they're going to suffer. They're going to suffer, and and they're going to be patient in impatient in their suffering. But when that death finally does come, it's going to be a relief to them, and they're going to be happy. Yes, the saints that are killed by the alt by the harlot go under the altar. Yeah, so. it does not indicate specifically where they go. Um, I would assume at this point they would go into paradise uh, because they are they're not Christian, so they don't go into the third heaven. Because, well, more specifically, the the chamber right now in the third heaven that's holding those who are in the church would no longer it would be empty because the church would be resurrected so they're not going to go into an empty chamber waiting they would um, and paradise is the place where all other saved of all dispensations actually go so they would go into paradise but scripture doesn't specifically say where they go like it does actually for the ones under the altar they are there's a specific location where they go so there's a difference. So we don't want to mix these two groups up. One is killed in the first half of the tribulation period. These are the ones who are going to be killed moving forward. And then we have the reapers. So as describing the reapers here, these would be, uh, now the, again, this jumps to the end of the tribulation period. We are now, uh, and is very specific in the way that it's described. We have the first one who is the son of man, which is very clearly in context, Christ, in his humanity. An angel is going to turn to him and say, hey, it's time for reaping. He, in his um, divine nature, is going to make a request to the father to, for the father to turn over the nations because he wants his inheritance. The father is going to turn the nations over to him. And then he, this would be God, the son in his humanity is going to physically return to this earth and destroy the nations. Destroy, excuse me, let me be more specific. He's going to destroy the army that's coming up against him and break, crush the nations. We're not going to have a world system anymore, but we will actually have nations that are not Gentile or nations that are not Jews that is Gentiles, in the millennial kingdom. Okay, that will actually happen. And then we have during this also a second reaper who's coming out. And this is a second angel with another sharp sickle. It's not Christ. And he is instructed by, more than likely it's Michael, because Michael is the one who stands up for Israel. And he is the one who has authority over the fire that relates to the altar in the context there so he's going to instruct the second angel to go down and to reap all of the vines and this would again relate to any unsaved jew that's in the in the wilderness there will be a lot of unsaved jews in the wilderness by the way they'll be saved and unsaved ones because during this time there's even going to be people who rise up in jerusalem or well more specifically in israel because they're out in the wilderness who are going to say that they're the Messiah and get people to follow them, and they're going to perish as a result of this. And during this time, you are going to see coming back into um, play prophets and signs and wonders and all of this other stuff that God is doing to show Israel that he is the one who's working. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to be thrown into the great, rind, the great wine press, and of course, that's referring to the Battle of Armageddon, where Christ is going to come, and he's going to take what belongs to him. So the angel, uh, like I said, is specifically the first one, the first messenger that's likened to the Son of uh, Man, is actually Christ. The second angel 
which is not Christ because he's not likened to the son of man that comes out of the Holy of Holies. He is the one who's going to cast these rebellious uh, Jews into the wine press along with the Gentiles at this point. So that's where we're at here as we come into the end of the book of, or end of the chapter here in Revelation chapter 14, where we have the reapers and then the 200. I know some scripture, or actually some reference it as 200 miles, but I think if you actually count out a stadii, it's like 180, 176, 180, somewhere around there. I don't think the extra 20 miles or so is going to matter because it's going to be pretty bloody, you know, because Christ is going to respond with their violence, with extreme violence, and he's going to destroy them. And of course, we're going to have the setting up of the uh, millennial kingdom, but the book of Revelation is now going to shift, and we're going to start getting a little bit more detail on some of the things that are actually happening. So... Like I said, the, the chapter 14 kind of jumps us around a little bit, and we got to pay attention because most of it's kind of a summary. But the, you know, the first part start, starts out with the, the, the eternal gospel, and then we jump from the eternal gospel. Of, well, actually, we specifically start out with 144,000 who are singing. That's at the end of the tribulation period. And then we have the eternal gospel, which is uh, in the context, I really do believe that that's referring to the gospel during the, the millennial kingdom. And then we drop to the warning to the beasts and the followers of the beast. And now we have the reapers at this point. And then, like I said, we're, as we move on, we're going to get into a little bit more detail about what exactly is going to happen in these um, specific situations.